American Politics Today, Chapter 13, Access to the Supreme Court, the Courts. It is extremely difficult to have a case heard by the Supreme Court. Currently, the court hears just over 1% of the cases submitted. 73 out of 6,442 cases in the most recent completed term. This section explains how the court decides which cases to hear. When a case is submitted, the, court, the clerk of the court assigns its, a number and places it on the docket, which is the schedule of cases. The court's workload. Statistics of the courts of statistics on the Supreme Court's workload initially suggest that the size of the docket has increased dramatically since nineteen since the nineteen seventy see figure three point thirteen point three. However, a majority of cases are frivolous and are dismissed after limited review. Although the increase in workload is not significant as it appears due to high number of frivolous cases. Another change is more important. The number of opinions issued by the court has fallen by more than half in the past 35 years. The court heard about 150 cases each year through the 1980s, but this number has fallen to only 65 to, no to 95 in recent years. See again figure 13.3. There is no good explanation why for why the court issues half as many opinions as it used to. Other than that, the chief justices have decided that the court shouldn't issue so many opinions. I'll go ahead and zoom in on that so you may read that. And here's the court cases. Rules of access. Before I start that, I'll go ahead and do that so that you can write that down. Rules of access. With the smaller number of cases being heard, it is more important to understand how the court decides which ones to consider. There are four paths to it that a case may take to get the Supreme Court. First, Article 3 of the Constitution specifies that the court has original jurisdiction in cases involving foreign ambassadors or foreign countries and cases in which a state is a party as a a practical matter. The court shares jurisdiction with the lower courts on these issues in recent years. The court has invoked original jurisdiction only in cases involving disputes between two or more states over territorial or natural resource issues. For example, New Jersey and New York disagreed over which state should control about 24 acres of filled land that the federal government had added around Ellis Island, and Texas and New Mexico disagreed over which state should have access to water from the Rio Grande River. Recent disputes <clears throat> often concern water rights. One water dispute between Texas and New Mexico over the Pecos River Compact has been going on since 1960. In the history of our nation, only about 190 cases have made it to the court through this path. And typically these cases do not have any broader significance beyond the interest of the parties involved. The other three routes of the court are all on appeal. As a matter of right, usually called on appeal, through certification or through a writ of satori from the Latin to be informed. Cases on appeal are those that Congress has determined to be so important that the Supreme Court must hear them. Lately, Congress has given the court much more discretion on these cases. The only ones that the courts is still compelled to take over on appeal are some voting rights and redistricting cases. The fourth path is the most common. At least 95% of the cases in most sessions arrive through writ of satori. In these cases, a lit lit litigant 
who lost in a lower court can file a petition to the Supreme Court explaining why it should hear the case. If four justices agree, the case will get a full hearing. This is called the rule of four. This process may sound simple, but sifting through the 6,500 or so cases that court receives every year and deciding which 70 to 75 of them will be heard is daunting. In fact, former Justice William O. Douglas said that this winnowing process, in many respects, the most important and interesting of all of our functions. The court's criteria. How does the court decide which cases to hear? Several factors come into play, including the specific characteristics of the case and the broader politics surrounding it. Although several criteria generally must be met before the court will hear the case, justices will have leeway in defining the boundaries of these conditions. Collusion, standing, and mootness. First, there are constitutional guidelines which are sparse. The Constitution limits the court hearing actual cases and controversies, which has been interpreted to mean that the court cannot offer advisory opinions about hypothetical situations, but must deal with actual cases. The term actual controversy also includes several other concepts that limit whether a case will be heard. Collusion, standing, and mootness. Collusion simply means that the lit litigants in the case cannot want the same outcome and cannot be testing the law without an actual dispute occurring between the two parties. Standing as noted earlier means that the party bringing the case must have a personal stake in the outcome. The court has discretion in defining standing. It may hear cases that the justices think are important, even when the plaintiff may not have standing as traditionally understood, or it may duck up cases that may be politically sensitive on the ground that there is no standing. In an example of the former, uh, the former, the court decided several important racial redistricting cases, even when the white plaintiffs had not suffered any personal harm by being in the black majority districts. In an example of the latter, the court decided not to hear a politically sensitive case involving the Pledge of Allegiance and the First Amendment, saying that the father of the student who brought the case did not have a standing because he did not have sufficient custody over his daughter. He was divorced and the mother had primary custody. Clearly, the court was more eager to voice its views on redistricting than on the Pledge of Allegiance because it could not it could have just as easily decked the former case by saying that the plaintiffs did not have standing and taken up the latter case despite the concern over custody. It was his daughter, after all, which should have given him the concern, given him some, oh, I'm sorry, the concern over custody. It was his daughter, after all, which should have given him the, some stake. This is an important point to consider. The court often avoids hearing a controversial case based on a threshold issue, such as standing, and then does not have to decide on the merits of, this, of the case. A controversial must still be relevant when the court hears the case mootness occurs when a case is irrelevant by the time it is brought before federal courts. Nonetheless, there are exceptions to this principle because some types of cases are necessarily moot by the time they get to the Supreme Court. For example, exceptions have been made for the abortion cases because pregnancy lasts only nine months and it takes it always takes longer than that for a case to get from district court to the appeals court to the Supreme Court. Thousands of cases every year met, meet these basic criteria. 
One very simple guideline eliminates the largest number of cases. If a case does not involve a substantial federal question, it will not be heard. This essentially means that the court does not have to hear a case if the justices do not think it is important enough. Of course, the federal part of the standard is also important. If a case governed by state law rather than the, by federal law, the court will decline to hear the case unless there, there are constitutional implications. Here are the, the words. Here we go. That way you can pause that. Internal politics. Since the 1970s, most justices have used a cert pool, whereby their law clerks take a first cut at the cases. Law clerks to the justices are top graduates of elite schools who help the justices with background research at several stages of the process. Clerk writes, clerks write joint memos about joint uh, about groups of cases providing their recommendations about which cases should be heard. The ultimate decisions are up to the justices, but clerks have significant power to help shape the agenda. The chief justice has an important agenda setting power. He or she decides the, dis the discuss list for a given day. Any justice can add a add a case to the list, but there is no systematic evidence on how to, often this happens. Only 20 to 30 percent of the cases are discussed in conference, which means that about three quarters of the cases that are submitted to the Supreme Court are never even discussed by the justices. The decision not to discuss certain cases is often justified because of the high proportion of frivolous suits submitted to the court. Many factors outside of the legal requirements or internal processes of the court influence access to the court and which cases will be heard. Cases that have generated a lot of activity from interest groups or other governmental parties, such as the Solicitor General, are more likely to be heard. The Solicitor General is a presidential appointee who works in the Justice Department and supervises the litigation of the executive branch. In cases in which the federal government is a party, the Solicitor General or someone else from that office will represent the government in court. The court accepts about 70 to 80 percent of cases in which the U.S. government is a party, compared to about 1 percent overall. Even with these influences, the court has a great deal of desecration on which cases it hears. Well-established practices such as standing and mootness may be ignored or modified. If the court wants to hear a specific case, however, one final point is important. Although the justices may pick or, and choose their cases, they cannot completely set their own agenda. They can only select from the cases that come to them. Hearing cases before the Supreme Court. A surprisingly small proportion of the court's time, only about 37 days per term, is actually spent hearing cases. The court's term extends from the first Monday in October through the end of June. It hears cases on Mondays through Wednesdays in alternating two-week cycles, in which it is in session from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a one-hour break for lunch. In two weeks of the cycle, when it is not in session, justices review briefs, write opinions, and sit through the next batch of petitions. On most Fridays during the court's term, the justices meet in conference to discuss cases that have been argued and decided which cases they will hear. Opinions are released throughout the term, but the bulk of them come in May and June. The court in recess from July through September, the justices may take some vacation, 
but they mostly use the time for studying, reading, writing, and preparing for the next term. During the summer, the court also considers emergency petitions, such as stays of execution, and occasionally hears exceptionally important cases, as it did in 2009. For example, when the court heard a challenge to the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, more commonly known as the McCain-Fingold Act, after its two principal sponsors, Congress urged the court to give the law a speedy review, given its importance for upcoming 2010 elections. In the blockbuster case, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, the Supreme Court decided that independent spending in campaigns by corporations and labor unions is protected by the First Amendment. Here's the vocabulary words for the next section. Sometimes it does a real good job. There we go. Briefs during its regular sessions. The courts follow rigor, rigid, rigidity, I'm so sorry, rigidly set routines that justice prepare for a case by briefing, by reading the briefs submitted by both parties. Because the Supreme Court hears only appeals, it does not call witness or gather new evidence. Instead, in structured briefs of no more than 50 pages, the parties present their arguments about why they either support the lower court decision or believe the case was improperly decided. Interest groups often submit amicus curie, friend of the court, briefs that convey their opinions to the court. In fact, 85% of the cases before Supreme Court have at least one amicus brief. The federal government also files the amicus briefs on important issues such as school busing, school prayer, abortion, reapportionment of legislative districts, job discrimination against women and minorities, and affirmative action in higher education. It is difficult to determine the impact of the amicus briefs on the outcome of a case, <clears throat> but those that are filed early in the process increase the chances that the case will be heard. Given the limited information that justices have about any given case, interest groups involvement can be a strong signal about the importance of, the, of a case. There is also some evidence that briefs from the solicitor general have an impact on the outcome of a case. Oral argument. Once the briefs have, are filed and have been reviewed by the justices, cases are scheduled for oral arguments. Except in usual circumstances, each case gets one hour, which is divided evenly between the two parties. In, a, in especially important cases, extra time may be granted. For example, the Obamacare case had six hours of oral argument, which was the most since a Voting Rights Act case in 1966. Usually there is only one lawyer for each side who presents the case, but parties that have filed amicus briefs may participate if their arguments would provide assistance to the court, not otherwise available given that tight time, the tight time pressure. The court generally does not extend the allotted time allow friends of the court to testify. Some lawyers may not use all their time because their train of thought is interrupted by aggressive questioning. Transcri transcripts reveal that justices jump in with questions almost immediately and some attorneys never regain their footing. The frequency and point pointedness of the questions vary by justice. With justices Breyer, Kagan, Roberts, Sotomayor, Sotomayor being the most aggressive on the current court. Justice Thomas 
went more than 10 years without asking a single question, but broke his stake, his streak in 2016, perhaps feeling the need to fill the void creating by the death of Justice Scalia. Cameras are not allowed in the courtroom, so most Americans have never seen the court in action. Although a small live audience is admitted every morning, the court is in session and live audio was streamed online for the first time ever in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're curious about the oral arguments, audio recordings of every case since 1995 are available at www.oyzeez.org. I will leave this link at the bottom of the thing for this. Here is how did you know? Conference. After oral arguments, the justice meet in conference to discuss and then vote on the cases. As with initial conferences, these meetings are conducted in secret. We know based on notes in the personal papers of retired justices that the conferences are orderly and structured, but cannot, but can become quite heated. The justices take turns discussing the cases and outlining the reasons for their positions. Opinion writing. After justices indicate how they are likely to vote on a case, if the chief justice is in the majority, which is most of the time, the chief justice will, who will write the majority opinion. Otherwise, the most senior justice in the, in the majority assigns the opinions. Several considerations determine how an opinion will be assigned. First, the chief justice will try to ensure the smooth operation of court, including considerations such as which justices may be able to take on the work of writing a given opinion. A second factor for, is for the justice individual's areas of expertise. For example, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor developed expertise on racial redistricting cases and authored most of the decisions in the 1990s while Justice Samuel Alito has specialized in criminal case, justice cases in recent years. Strategy in the court, other factors in how opinions are assigned are more strategic, taking into account the court's external relations, internal relations, and the personal policy goals of the opinion assigner. The court must be sensitive to how others might respond to its decisions because it must rely on the other branches of government to enforce them. One famous example of this consideration in an opinion assignment came in a case from the 1940s that struck down a practice that had prevented Amer African Americans from voting in Democratic primaries. Originally, the opinion was assigned to Justice Felix Frankfurter, but Justice Robert Jackson wrote a memo suggesting that it might be unwise to have a liberal, political, politically independent Jew from the Northeast write an opinion that was sure to be controversial in the South. Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone agreed and reassigned the opinion to Justice Stanley Reed, a Protestant and Democrat from Kentucky. It may not seem that the court is sensitive to public opinion, but these kinds of considerations have happen fairly frequently in important case, cases. Internal considerations occasionally cause justices to vote strategically. That is differently from their sincere preferences so they can put themselves in the majority. If they're the most senior justice in the majority, they can. They then have the power to assign the opinion and they often assign it to themselves. After the opinions are assigned, the justices work on writing a draft opinion. Law clerks typically help with this process. The drafts are circulated to other justices for comments and reactions. 
Some bargaining may occur in which a justice says he or she will withdraw support unless a provision of the opinion is changed. Justices may join the majority opinion, may write a separate concurring opinion, or may dissent. See nuts and bolts 13.2 on the typical opinions. I'll zone in on this part. There we go. Now it's focusing. So you may pause this and read this. This is types of the Supreme Court's decision. And then here is another vocabulary word for the next page. If it focuses. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sorry about that. Dissents. Two final points about the process of writing and issuing opinions are important. First, until 1940, a premium was placed on a unanimous decision. This changed dramatically in the 1940s when most cases had at least one dissent. Lately, about two thirds of the cases have had a dissent. However, in the 2013-2014 term, two thirds of the cases were unanimous the highest proportion since at least 1946. That proportion fell to 36% in the 2019-2020 term. Second dissents serve an important purpose. Not only do they allow the minority view to be expressed, but they also provide, also often provide the basis for subsequent Quintly reversing a poorly reasoned case. Moreover, when justices strongly oppose the majority decision, they may take the unusual step of reading a portion of their dissent from the bench. This is why should I care? <clears throat> Supreme Court decision making. Judicial decision making is influenced by many different factors but the two main categories are legal and political. Legal factors include the precedence of earlier cases and the norm that justices must follow the language of the constitution. Political influences include the justices' preferences or ideologies, their stances on whether the court should take a restrained or activist role with respect to the elected branches and external factors such as public opinion and interest groups involvement. Legal factors. The most basic legal factor is precedent, which we discussed earlier. Precedent does not determine the, an, the outcome of any given case, but because every case has a range of precedences. Those, that can serve to justify a justice's decision the easy cases in which law, settled law makes the outcome obvious are less likely to be heard by the court because of the justice's desire to focus on the more controversial areas of unsettled law at, or cases in which there is conflict between lower court's decisions. Excuse me. However, in some areas of the law, such as free speech, the death penalty, and search and seizure. Precedent is an important explanation for how the justice decide a case. The Constitution is the obvious starting point for any Supreme Court case that involves a constitutional right. However, there are various perspectives on exactly how and to what degree the language of the Constitution can and should influence judicial decisions making Today, people in one camp argue that the language used in the Constitution is the most important guiding factor. Their perspectives fall under the heading of strict construction. The most basic of these is the literalist view of the Constitution. Literalists argue the justices need to look further than actual words of the Constitution. However, critics of strict construction point out that the Constitution is silent on many important points, 
such as a right to privacy and could not have anticipated the changes in technology in the 20th century or 20th and 21st centuries there that have meant have that have many legal implications that is a, such as sorry such as eavesdropping devices cloning and the internet also the language also although the language of the first amendment relative is relatively clear when it comes to political speech other equally important words of the constitution such as necessary and proper executive power equal protection and due process are open-ended and vague those are in other camp are often described as supporting a living constitution perspective on the document see chapter two they argue that strict con construction can make a nation the prisoner of its past and reject any constitutional development save constitutional amendment if the justices are bound to follow the literal words of the constitution with the meaning they had when the document was written we certainly could be legally frozen in time amending the constitution is a long and difficult process so that option is not always viable way for the constitution to reflect changing norms and values here's this so you can see the words political factors the living constitution perspective points out to the second set of influences on supreme court decision making political factors indeed many people are uncomfortable thinking about the court and in political terms and prefer to think of the image of blind justice in which the constitutional principles are fairly applied. However, political influences are clearly evident in the court, maybe less than in Congress or the presidency, but they are certainly present. This means the courts respond to and shape poli politics in ways that often involve compromise, but within the courts themselves and in the broader political system. Political ideology and attitudes. There is evidence that justices' ideology or attitudes about various issues influence their decisions. Those who argue that this is the most important factor in understanding Supreme Court decision making are said to take an attitudinalist approach. Liberal judges are strong defenders of individual civil liberties, including defendants' rights, tend to be pro-choice on abortion, support regulatory policy to protect the environment, and workers support national intervention in states, and favor race, conscious po policies such as affirmative action, Conservative judges favor state regulation of private conduct, especially on moral issues. Support prosecutors over defendants tend to be pro-life on abortion. And support the free market and property rights over the environment and workers. States' rights over national intervention and a colorblind policy on race. These are, of course, just general tendencies. However, they do provide a strong basis for explaining patterns of decisions, especially on some types of cases. See what do the facts say feature for more on how the balance between liberal and conservative judges have sh has shifted. Other justices and politicians' preferences. Another approach to understanding Supreme Court decision making no, known as the strategic model focuses on justices, calculations about the preferences of other justices, the pres president and Congress, the choices that other justices are likely to make, 
and other institutional context within which they operate. After all, justices do not operate alone. At a minimum, they need the votes of four of their colleagues if they want their position to prevail. Therefore, it makes sense to focus on the strategic interactions that take place to build coalitions. The media voter, the median voter on the court, the one in the middle, when the justices are arrayed from the most liberal to the most conservative, has an especially influential role in the strategic model. For many years, the median justice was Anthony M. Kennedy, the four conservatives to his right and the four liberals to his left all wanted to attract his vote. When Justice Sotomayor replaced Justice Souter, Justice Keegan, Kagan replaced Justice Stevens and Justice Gorush replaced Justice Scalia, Kennedy remained the median voter on the court. When Kennedy retired and Brett Kavanaugh took his place, Roberts became the medium and the center of the court stayed roughly the same place. With Justice Barrett replacing Ginsburg, Kavanaugh is the new median with the center moving slightly to the right. Research shows that at least one justice switches his or her vote at some stage in the process from the initial com conference to or oral arguments to the final vote. On at least half of the cases, so strategic bargaining appears to be fairly common. Our earlier discussion of opinion assignment and writing opinions to attract the support of a special justice is more evidence in support of the strategic model. Here is the vocabulary words. There it's focused. Separation of powers. Another political influence on justice's decision-making is their view of the place of the court with respect to the democratically elected institutions. Congress and the president, spe specifically do they favor an activist or a restrained role for the court. Advocates of the ju judicial restraint argue that ju judges should defer for to the elected branches and not strike down their laws or other actions. In contrast, advocates of judicial activism argue that the courts must play an active role in interpreting the Constitution to protect minority rights, even if this means overturning the actions of the elected branches. Yet another approach says that these normative arguments about how restraint or activism ought to work don't really matter because the court usually follows public opinion and rarely plays a lead role in promoting policy change. Judicial activism, a central question concerning the role of the court within our political system revolves around judicial review. Should the court strike down laws passed by Congress and actions of the executive activism or defer to the elected branches restraint? Often the answer to this question varies when considered in light of specific lines of cases. A political conservative may favor activist decision striking. I love it when they do that. Okay, <laughs> sorry, it stopped in the middle. That way you can read this. Feel free to pause the video. This is really tiny down here, so I don't know how to... That bottom part portion is not going to focus. Sorry about that, guys. Shifting down environmental laws or workplace regulation, but oppose activist decisions that defend flag burning or defendants' rights. Political liberals may do the opposite, calling for judicial restraint on the first of set of cases. But for judicial activism to protect civil liberties, the term activist judge, judges often appears 
and the media. Sometimes the media mistakenly asserts that liberal justices are more activist than conservative justices. In fact, however, that is not always the case. The current court is quite conservative, but it is also activist. The separation of powers continues to play a role after the justices have issued their rulings. In some instances, the court can force its view on the other branches. In other cases, it needs their support to enforce its decisions. The court's lack of enforcement power is especially evident when ruling applies broadly to millions of people who care deeply about the issue. Consider a school prayer, which still exists in hundreds of public schools despite of having been ruled unconstitutional nearly 60 years ago. It is impossible to enforce the ban unless someone in school complains and brings a lawsuit. The president and Congress often fight back when they think the court is exerting too much influence, which can limit the court's power as a policy-making institution. For example, the president can fail to enforce a decision vigorously and Congress can block appointments it disagrees with, limit the jurisdiction of the federal courts, change the size of the court, or even impeach a judge. The latter three options are rarely used. The most common way for Congress to respond to a court decision that it disagrees with is, is to pass legislation that overturns the decision. If the case concerns the interpretation of a law, in general, the court avoids stepping on the toes of the other branches unless it is absolutely necessary. The court often exercises self-imposed restraint and refuses to action to act on political questions, issues that are outside the judicial domain and should be decided by elected officials. Should you want to read that? Outside influences, interest groups, and public opinion. Finally, there are external influences on the court, such as public opinion and interest groups. We have already talked about the role of interest groups in filing amicus briefs. When it comes to the court, this is the only venue of influence open to interest groups. Other tactics such as lobbying and fundraising are either inappropriate or irrelevant because justices are not elected. The role of public opinion is more complex. Obviously, justices do not consult public opinion polls the way elected officials do. However, there are several indirect ways that the court expresses the public preferences. The first way, the first indirect way involves the act that the public elects the, the president and the Senate who nominate and confirm the justices. Therefore, sooner or later, the court should reflect the views of the public. Work by political scientists has confirmed that this is to be largely the case, especially in recent years when Supreme Court nominations have become more political and more important to the public. The second mechanism through which public opinion may influence the court is somewhat more direct when the public has a clear position on an issue that is before the court. The court tends to agree with the public. Several high profile examples support the idea that the court is sensitive to public opinion. The court switched during the New Deal in the 1930s to support Roosevelt's policy agenda after standing in the way for four years, gave into wartime opinion to support the international or internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, limited on an accused child molester's right to confront his or her accuser in a courtroom and supported same-sex marriage. In each of these cases, the justices reflected the current public opinion of the nation rather than strict reading of the Constitution of the Founders' intent. On the other hand, there are plenty of decisions in which the courts has stood up for unpopular views, such as banning prayer in schools, allowing flag burning, 
and protecting criminals' defendants' rights. Another way that the court may consider the public mood is to shift the timing of a decision. The best example here is the landmark school desegregation case Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, which the court sat on for more than two years until after the 1952 presidential election because it didn't think the public was ready for its bombshell ruling. Others have argued the, the court rarely changes its views to reflect public opinion, but a minimum of minimum the evidence supports the notion that court is usually in step with the public. Here's why should I care? Unpacking conflict. Considering all that we've discussed in this chapter, let's apply what we know about how the courts work to the events introduced at the beginning of this chapter. Justice Jimberg's comments about President Donald Trump during the 2016 presidential election and Chief Justice Roberts' defense is of the independence of the courts in rebutting Trump's complaint about an Obama judge. Did Justice Ginsburg overstep her boundaries with her remarks on Donald Trump, or was it appropriate to express her opinions? Was Justice Roberts overreacting to Trump's comments about political judges? What is the proper place of the courts within our political system? Should judges attempt to neutrally apply the law or should their political views play a role? The chapter open, opening examples demonstrates how often that how, how that we often have a difficult time coming to grips with the political nature of the Supreme Court and prefer the comforting image of the neutral and fair lady justice. That is why there is such a strong reaction to Justice Ginberg's comments about Trump. We want our courts to be politically neutral, but the reality is very different. Politics is indeed everywhere, even in the courts, where you would least expect to see it. Politics affects everything from the selection of judges to the decisions they make. Some characteristics of the federal courts, most important of which judges' lifetime tenure, insulate the system from politics. However, courts are subject to influence by judges' ideologies, interest groups, and the president and senate, who try to shape the court's composition through nomination process. While many recoil from the politicized court, we also value its independence and don't want the president and Congress stepping on its toes. Thus, if the federal courts are allowed to play their proper role, they can serve as a referee between the other branches of government and between the national and state governments by defining the boundaries of permissible conduct. The courts demonstrate the pol that politics is Conflictual and many conflicts demonstrate that the courts are political. Although plenty of unanimous Supreme Court decisions do not involve much conflict among the justices, many landmark cases deeply divide the court on constitutional interpretation and how the, to balance those competing interpretations against other values and interests. These conflicts in the court often reveal deeper fault lines in the broader political system.